Hello and welcome back to the Healthcare and Complicated YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to the channel to get all these amazing content every week. Everything to do with healthcare technology and life sciences industries. And today I have another guest for you, Ami Lahav. He's an advisor for Pharma and MedTech, also a board member, a speaker and a startup mentor. Amir, how are you? Good, good. Hi, Shoal. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for uh, being in here and accepting the invite. Of course, of course, it's a pleasure. And today we have a very exciting topic for you, remote patient monitoring in pharma and healthcare. And the first question that I have for you, Amir, is how does remote patient monitoring in pharma and healthcare settings impact patient engagement and adherence to treatment plans? The first really begins with building trust, building trust uh, in, in the concept that uh, we can remotely and accurately monitor somebody's health without bringing them to the hospital. There is really no need uh, for many of the tests that we're doing to burden a patients and bring them to the hospital where when we can use technology, very innovative software and hardware to collect uh, data in a very good resolution actually collect data way more frequently on a daily basis that will represent how the patient feels much more robustly and accurately as opposed to when you bring the patients every three months to the hospital and get a snapshot of what he or she are doing. So that concept that was really brought to us as a present by COVID, COVID did terrible things to the world, but for remote patient monitoring, it definitely did good because people realized that, you know, there is no other choice. And that choice of, of remotely monitor patient is actually not a bad idea. You get a lot of benefit from it. Um, it helps the patient also to uh, keep them on track with their medication, help them monitor their disease more holistically because they get data. We, we all like data, patients like data. They want to know how, how their disease is affecting their life, the more tools we give them to monitor without going outside the house, the better. Mm -hmm. I would really keep the, the visits to the hospital, you know, when you have an MRI uh, procedure, right? Or we're not going to ship the MRI scanner to your house. There are things that you have no, uh, no um, you know, you have no uh, choice but to go to the hospital. Yeah, fantastic. I really like that. Certainly COVID left us that kind of uh, legacy, oh, yeah. good and bad, but that for the industry was kind of good because we're starting to, we push to the things in a different way. Certainly remote patient monitoring was an acquisition. Moving on, what uh, technology and advancements have been pivotal in enhancing the efficacy and the accuracy in remote patient monitoring systems within within the pharma and the healthcare industries? Yeah, so pharma, you know, what, what pharma realizes is that, that they're putting a huge amount of money and in investing in a clinical trial. And at the end, more often than not, the trial does not meet the primary endpoint and the program basically fails and everything goes to trash. And the, the, the truth is that many times the trial is actually perfectly uh, successful and the drug is really effective, but the tools that we're using to measure that signal, to measure the improvement, to measure the benefits that the drug is given to the patient, the tools are not, are not good enough. They're not sensitive enough to small changes. And as I, and, and, um, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of those tools are based on uh, subjective evaluation of a physician or patient reported outcomes on a, on a questionnaires and even in 2024 it's it amazes me every time that this is the gold standard that people decide fda ema they decide if a drug is going to be approved or not based on subjective measurements that are not quantitative and there could be there could be so much uh, noise into this data, and even if something comes up significant, it could be just a fluke. Uh, 
you know, in 2024, when we have remote patient monitoring technology, we have mobile apps, we have uh, wearable sensors that you know a lot about, I know, you know, we can leverage all of those, all of this data to really understand what's going on with the patients in the real world mm. and obtain measurements of health that are clinically meaningful and also relevant to the patient. The patients want, I can, you know, I always give the example of uh, in oncology, sometimes they look at tumor size, tumor size is the primary endpoint. And at the end of the trial, they say the tumor was significantly smaller in the treatment group. Mm. But when you actually ask the patient and you test, you, you use, you know, wearable device on the patients, you can see maybe the tumor was smaller, but the patients feel really bad. They eat no, no energy. They're tired. They nap during the day. They're, they're, they have fatigue. They, they, they don't care that the tumor is smaller if there is no actually uh, a real change in their uh, quality of life. And, and this is where wearables and mobile apps that measure quality of life in a quantitative way is a game changer. And pharma begins to understand that if they really want to show the beauty and the, and the magnitude of the effectiveness of their drug, they cannot just focus on primary endpoint. Mm. They need to look at more uh, holistic and broader uh, uh, set of, of measurements. Yeah, thank you, Amir. You know, I'm a great fan and advocate of wearables. And you mentioned a lot of things there that certain things are very difficult to measure, but now wearables are actually bring not just the data, but they're starting to have uh, the behavioral data and and the mobile apps can complement that with feelings and check out of people. So yeah, things are changing. And uh, what you mentioned there, it was a very complex kind of environment uh, a while ago, but I think now the awareness is broadened out there and uh, pharma and healthcare, sometimes I'm a bit um, disappointed they're not fully capitalizing on what is on offer, but anyway. I, I completely yeah. agree with you. You know, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I remember we used wearables in trials and it was a little bit of a black box, like mm. in the airplane. You, you used to send the wearables to the patients, the patients send them back to you. There was no Bluetooth, the data wasn't in the cloud and you would get data that is, to be honest, it was out of context. Mm. You were not there with your eyes to actually see how the data was collected. What was the, exactly the patient doing around that time and you would just get accelerometry data yeah. completely out of the blue and that makes it very difficult to to analyze but these days as you very uh, beautifully uh, uh, put together these days we have a lot of data coming hmm. that that is complementary to the wearable data from our ability to uh, surveillance our patients with mobile apps with with uh, they're on smartphone. We have all the contextual features and information to put together. So we really understand what was the patient doing yeah. at that time? What was their heart rate? What was, the, were they moving? Were they happy? Was there after they took medication? Like everything is digital. So you can really aggregate all these mm. uh, points to uh, allow you to virtually be with the patient at the time of the data was collected, even though you were not physically there, just by uh, the, the richness of the data. So yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. This is a fascinating conversation, uh, Amir. Look, moving on to the third and last question. In what ways does remote patient monitoring contribute to personalized medicine strategies and improve patient outcomes, particularly in chronic disease management? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really beautiful uh, question. In chronic disease, you know, like in, in cardiovascular, metabolic, di diabetes, uh, we are actually uh, guilty in doing medicine like back in the old days instead of doing medicine in the modern days. In the modern days, we're not waiting for something to happen. Hmm. Medicine used to be reactive. 
Now medicine is proactive. You use that wearable data in real time. There is an algorithm that analyzes it. Say I, you know, say it's a glucose monitoring with an activity monitoring at the same time, two wearables that I wear. Uh, you can combine them into one. They give you accurate data in real time and you feed back the patients with actionable recommendations and insight mm. to the point that you create personalized precision medicine. Yeah, Amir, thank you so much. We're coming to the end of uh, the interview. Thank you so much for your time, your expertise, this magnificent insight. But also, I think you have um, um, some news about an event. Tell our audience about your event in Boston at the end of right. the year. Please go ahead and then I, I, and then I wrap up. Yeah, yeah, October 7, 8, 9. Listen, I'm telling you, this is, this is, I'm super excited about it. The Digital Health and AI Innovation Summit, uh, we, we really create, uh, uh, it, it's a, it's a fast-growing community of people who really care to make a difference. They don't have ego. Uh, they say, let's cut the bullshit. I hope it's okay to say bullshit. Mm -hmm. You're not going to beat me. But let's just talk about even things that didn't work, about failures. Mm -hmm. So we can learn from each other. We're not going to put patients again and burden them with an approach or a device that didn't work. A lot of people will come together from pharma, from medtech, from academia, from healthcare. All of very diversified uh, group of patients, or some people call it the Amir's Friends uh, Conference. Mm -hmm. Everybody is invited, and, and I think it's going to be really super fun. Fantastic. I will be there too, Amir. Thank you so much. Oh, look, we, I we, we are last... honored to have you there. Yeah, See you in Boston. That would be that would be great. I have one last item that is related to the channel. I want a very short uh, answer, please. Which is, how can we make healthcare uncomplicated? How can we what? How can we make healthcare uncomplicated? Uncomplicated. Well. <laughs> You know, I think if we both knew the answer, we wouldn't be sitting here. We would already be uh, 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 in Aruba on lying on the beach because we solved the problem of, of the world. But unfortunately, uh, healthcare will always remain complicated. Uh, but I think we are the one, actually, that is responsible for how complicated it is. We have the tools these days to uh, uh, make it automated to make it better, to make it more efficient, while keeping the human touch and keeping the physician in the loop and not forgetting that medicine is just not just machine learning. It's also about human touch. And if we find the right balance between these two, I think we can uncomplicate medicine and modernize healthcare. Brilliant. Amir, thank you so much again. for uh, you. Nice to see you. And I certainly come to Boston at the end of the year. Thank you for having me. I'm going to wrap up now. To our viewers and listeners, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also acknowledge our channel partners. And I'm going to post Amir's socials in here. Make sure you connect with him on LinkedIn. Ask him any questions about his expertise in pharma and medtech and healthcare. And I'll see you all next week. Yeah.